Testing. Okay, this is the fourth lecture in our series of mathematical problems. And today we're going to discuss two things. But first, before we do the lecture, which will be on Gödel's theorem, I want to talk a little bit about the concept of proof. I've added two proofs. Well, not two proofs, but I've looking at the Pythagorean theorem. There's a nice uh, computer visualization of this theorem uh, by means of a Java applet. In fact, this is one of the classic applets. It, in fact, won an award in 1995, if you will, the best of show. It won the grand prize in Sun Microsystems Java programming contest seven years ago, so it was in the early ages of Java. Now when this uh, fires up in just a second, okay. Now what you do is you click this and it essentially leads you here. We can reset the triangle any size we want. So let's try this. So we'll just start with the proof of the Pythagorean theorem. Now this is a geometrical proof. So the goal of the Pythagorean theorem is to relate the area of this rectangle to the areas of these, and in fact to show that this area is the same as this area plus this area. Now the proof that's being shown here is essentially the proof that Euclid uh, originally developed. So the next step is to, to these rectangles, the a squared, b squared, here's c squared, into two. And what we're going to show is that we can essentially turn this area into half of an appropriate segmentation of this area. So what we're going to do is look at this rectangle and observe that we can deform this rectangle into this. Now, uh, we'll go over that in just a minute, but what you see is that, that this triangle shares a common base and it has the same height. So basically the triangle that was here originally, one half the base times the height, the areas of this triangle is invariant. So this triangle in blue has the same area as that. Now what we're going to do is observe that this is a perpendicular of this line and that this is a perpendicular of this. So if we rotate this, it's going to preserve the areas also. Now we're going to do this construction one more time saying that here, if we take the parallel here and use that as the height, and that this is a common base, that we can deform this triangle to move along that red line in such a way as to preserve the area. Now we're going to do the same thing for the green one. We're going to deform that into this long, thin rectangle. We're going to rotate it around and then slide the top along the base. So you can actually see that obviously this blue is half of this, green is half of that, and the sum is equal to the square. So half of this area has been stretched into this green triangle, and half of this triangle has been stretched into the blue. Now it's pretty clear from this construction, if you were just playing around with it, what the ultimate proof of the Pythagorean theorem would be if you use this particular way to show it and not by similar triangles. Now, what we, of course, need for this are some underlying facts or assumptions. Well, they're not assumptions, they're, they're facts on the area of the triangle. So, for example, let's just draw two. There's a straight line here. If I draw another straight line, here. And now if I draw a triangle with a common base, now, see, I don't know how to draw a dotted line here, but you can see clearly that if we share a common base and a common height, that all of these triangles are going to be the same area. So here, 
this is the, the common base. And this is going to be the common height. So going from here down to here, it's going to be the common height. OK. Now, what you can see clearly here, that the area of the triangle is going to be 1 half the base times the height. So this is the base, and this is the height. Now, this we know just from elementary geometry, right? Because if you take a triangle and you have this as the height, you can basically form a rectangle here and a rectangle here. And this area is half of that rectangle. And this area is half of this rectangle. So if this is B and this is the height, H, that area of the triangle is one half the base times the height. Now, it's not so clear if you have a long, tri skinny triangle like this. But again, if you use this as, say, b base 2, and this as base 1, then the area of this triangle is going to be 1 half. It's the larger triangle, which is 1 half b1 plus b2 times h minus this triangle, which is b1. So you get area is 1 half b2 times h, right? Just subtracting. So what this means is, is that if you have a common base here and a common height, you can shift the top of the rectangle or top of the triangle anywhere you want between, say, point P1, P2, and P3. So anywhere you want to draw the top of that, all of these here have the same area. That's exactly what you're doing here. So let's go over this again. i restart here. So the very first thing you do after drawing this triangle is you then split these here. Now, notice if I use this as the base and this as a height, I can move this anywhere I want along here. In particular, with that base and this height, I can move the point that was here all the way to this edge here. So this blue triangle is exactly the same area as this original triangle. Now note that because this and this are perpendicular and this and this are perpendicular, that I can rotate through just like so and preserve the area. It's just a, a shearing followed by a rotation. Now, this is a little bit more subtle, but if I use this as the base, and so the height would be the distance to a perpendicular, I'll have that perpendicular and this as the height, so I can move this point anywhere along that parallel line that's parallel to this. And that's exactly what I do here. I draw the line that's parallel. This distance now becomes the height. And then I move this point down to this line here. And clearly, this triangle is half the area of this rectangle. So I'm basically done if I can move this over to be half over here, which is what I do next. So I move this along the height. So this is a common base, and this is a height. I move the point all the way along here, preserving the height. Then, because these are two sets of perpendicular lines, I can rotate. And then I now use this as the height this as the base, and then I move this point along over to here. OK. So that's just to remind you what the proof of the, the Pythagorean theorem is. Now, the point of this is that it's very easy to get this geometrical construction and convince yourself by using this argument here to actually turn this into a rigorous proof. 
Okay, so that'll actually be sort of homework to be uh, is to just take this very geometrical visualization of the proof of the Pythagorean theorem and add it to a basic area fact here and just turn this into a much more precise proof of the Pythagorean theorem. There's another uh, visualization of this. Don Allen, Professor Allen, has uh, essentially done the same thing. It's not animated to the same extent. It's more or less a slideshow. So you construct the square along the hypotenuse, each of the other squares, drop the vertical line here, and we'll show, then he says, we'll show that this area is the same as this area. So he constructs this triangle, does the same construction here, and then rotates it. So that's half. And then he continues on with that one and does the same thing. So the less geometrical proofs uh, use similar triangles. Okay, so that's a very nice proof. And the idea of this is to show you that the, what motivates a proof can, in fact, be non-rigorous. I, I hope you realize that both of these are non-rigorous proofs, right? They are visualizations, they are convincing, and you can easily turn them into a rigorous proof, but they themselves are not rigorous. Okay, another example of the way in which computers inter interact with rigorous theorem proving is the four color theorem. Now, let's pop this up into its own window. Now, I hope everybody remembers or knows what the four color problem is. It's a problem that originated, uh, as you can see down here, back in the, uh, what is it, by a graduate student, actually. Uh, Francis Guthrie, while trying to color the map, um, okay, I thought, he, I think it's somewhere I read that he was a graduate student, in fact. Anyway, the problem is, is if you have a map, how many colors does it take to actually color in these countries? Now, you can easily use three, or, I mean, you can easily use four or more, but the question is, what's the minimum amount? So this actually has a very nice history of the four color. Now, I guess uh, the proof, again, well, the proof, actually, you can rigorously reduce the proof to an examination of a finite set of cases. Now, they have 633 unique configurations, and they show that every possible uh, uh, mapping of a plane can reduce to one of those 633 cases, how they overlap. And then what they do is show that each of those 633 cases can be uh, painted in four or fewer colorings. Now, the difficulty was is that each of those is a computation, and they actually used the computer to go through each of these cases. Now, this was the first major proof where a computer was used in a fundamental way. And some people have complained that, well, how can you prove the computer didn't make a mistake, right? I mean, that's a legitimate question. And there are people in computer science who actually worry about how you rigorously prove algorithms on the computer or prove that a computer algorithm uh, is correct or cannot fail. But this is, a, again, an example of sort of modern methods of proving where you can use things like computers and visualizations to not only generate the ideas for the proof, but actually incorporate them as an integral part of the proof. Okay, so that's an aside, more or less. In the homework problem, I'll add a 2B a two, two there where we'll add in a making the uh, proof of the Pythagorean theorem more precise using the, based on that visualization applet. Now today we're going to talk about lecture four, which is a continuation of 
lecture three on the axiomatic methods in mathematics. If you click on this link and you have at least Microsoft Explorer, it'll take you right to the appropriate page. So Bowers and Geller have a very brief reference to Gödel's theorem on, let's see, it's page 77 of your notes there. And it's only a page long, and then in the next page it uh, goes over to a list of references, problems in additional literature. However, I want, I've actually uh, given much more detail for Gödel's incompleteness theorem because it's a very important theorem. Uh, some people have said it's the most important theorem in mathematics of the 20th century. Because what it essentially says is that there is always something to do in mathematics. It would be very embarrassing if someone actually could prove that everything in mathematics followed rigorously by deductive logic from a set of 27 axioms. I mean, then once you did that, what would there be to do? I mean, <laughs> we'd all be out of a job, right? Once somebody finished all going through all these supposedly closed system of proofs. Well, what Gödel said is no matter how many axioms you have, when you think you've completed all the proofs and, and statements, correct statements that you can make from these axioms, there are in fact other statements that you can make which cannot be proven in the sense that whether these are true or false is independent of the axioms. So you can have the set of axioms with that extra additional postulate being true, or the same set of axioms with the postulate being false. As we saw before, an, a, a, an example is the continuum hypothesis and the axiom of choice. Now, I've got a link to Gödel's original paper. This is, of course, a uh, English translation. So this is, you can print this out if you want. This is, has some formatting on for the web, but it has the, the mathematics in here and the references. So you can go through and read the original, uh, but it's rather technical and it's rather complex. There's a nice little summary of the proof of Gödel's theorem, and this, by the way, is a, is a really nice reference because at the top of this, it has, it sort of integrates all of these Cantor's uncountability theorem with its diagonalization, uh, the halting problem or the Turing problem, uh, that's a very interesting one because this is the computer science version of Gödel's theorem. Uh, if you have a program, which is a set of instructions, you know, binary instructions, and you have an input, I, you can determine whether the program will halt or not for a specific P. But what this says is that there is no program which can do that for each program and every input. So there's no decidability for the set of all computer algorithms. And there's also Russell's paradox, the liar paradox, Tarski's uh, paradox, uh, Gödel's first and second incompleteness theorem. So this is a little bit different way of formulating it, but you can, you can read through that. I won't, I won't read it to you. You can just look at the web. This is a proof of Gödel's theorem that I have a link to that follows more or less a, a more formal, in terms of first order arithmetic and formal logic. And this, this comes from Stanford. And it reduces Gödel's incompleteness theorem to the existence of a Turing machine that can or cannot uh, do a specific procedure. So this ties in Turing machines and computer science with Gödel's proof. You can actually find some statements in numerical or, uh, or the set of numbers, the arithmetical system. So if you go down here to, I believe it's on Rucker. Uh, this is very, this is very nice. Uh, I'd like to just sort of walk through the logic in here. So supposedly there's this universal truth machine, which is a machine that's capable of correctly answering any question of all. Okay, so can you, is there such a machine? 
Well, the idea is that they're going to prove that there can't be. So someone introduces them to the supposedly uh, machine capable of answering any question at all. So then what he does is he asks for the program and the circuit design because it's built up of a finite number of electrical components and it has a certain finite uh, storage and everything else. So he just writes everything as a series of zeros and ones. Okay, so it can't be infinitely complicated. It's only finitely long. So you call the program that generates this universal truth machine P, or P of the universal truth machine. So then Gödel says, oh, I got you now, because he, he knows he's gone through this exercise many times. So he comes up with the following sentence. He says, quote, the machine which is constructed on the basis of the program P of UTM, which is after all UTM, will never say that this sentence is true. So G, the sentence is G for Gödel, is equivalent to saying the universal truth machine will never say G is true. So it's one of these self-referential statements. And we know from the liars paradox this sentence is false, that the, the statement this sentence is false can neither be true or false, right? Because if this sentence is false, is true, then it's false. And if it's false, it's true. So it's one of these self-referential paradox sentences. So Gurl laughs and he says, okay, is the sentence or the proposition G true or not? So if the universal truth machine says that the sentence is true, then it says that UTM will never say G is true. So that's false. Because the statement says that it will never say it's true, and if that statement is true, it will never say it's true, but it just did. So there's a contradiction there. And if UTM says uh, it's false, then G is false, because it's equivalent to the statement here. So then it's uttered a truth. So basically you have one of these. Again, you make a sentence that refers to itself, then you show that that cannot be decidable. So then you have established that this universal truth machine will in fact never say it's true, unless it can lie. <laughs> and that's one of the assumptions in this, is that you cannot prove an incorrect proposition from the axioms, because then otherwise you have defective logic. And of course you can prove anything you want if your logic is defective. So if you just go through this, it's sort of a, as he says, think about it, it grows on you. So you can actually formulate one of these sentences that's expressible within the system of propositions and axioms which cannot be decided on the basis of it. Now that idea, this little thought experiment, if you will, is the proof basically, contains the seed of the proof of Gödel's incompleteness theorem. There's another excellent discussion of Gödel's incompleteness theorem in this link. It's a little, again, a little bit more detailed. So these are, again, the statement that the axiom of choice and the continuum hypothesis are undecidable in the standard axiomatic set theory. And then there's a statement in combinatorics, a version of Ramsey's theorem, which can shown to be undecidable in the piano axioms system. Goodstein's theorem, and then there's some other things like this. There is another reference to an undecidable statement in information theory. So this is not just kind of paradoxes and abstract mum mumbledygook. This is actually real. I mean, mathematicians now accept this. Now, one of the proofs of, of Gödel's theorem, which I'll sketch out, relies on the Cantor's diagonalization argument, where he showed that the number of real numbers is greater than the cardinality of the natural numbers. Now, what he did here was to say, OK, suppose you have a listing. Suppose every single decimal number, including the rationals and irrationals, uh, can be put into a one-to-one -one correspondence with the counting numbers. Now, you can do that with the rational numbers. Actually, there is a nice little way of mapping every rational number between 0 and 1 with the natural numbers. That can yeah, it's kind of it's kind of this wandering up and over. Yeah, 
Well, this follows afterwards. Well, after you've shown that the rationals is in one-to-one, -one, you say is a set of all decimals, not just terminating decimals or repeating decimals, but is a set of irrationals in one-to-one -one correspondence with the if the set of real numbers is set. And this is the argument that it's not, because if it were, you could make a list. You could enumerate a list of all the decimals and just write them down. Here's my first, here's my second, here's my third. And, I mean, this was uh, not, I mean, we know nowadays that the number of reals is bigger than the number of rationals, but back then they were both infinity, and how do you compare infinities? Well, comparing by cardinality is, is the key. And what he showed is that the cardinality of the reals is greater by this argument. He says, suppose you could enumerate the list of all decimals between 0 and 1. Then you form this famous diagonal construction. You look at the diagonal number and you pick a digit which is different than D11. And then the second decimal place will differ from D22. Pick any of the other nine digits. Pick any of the other nine digits in the third place, different from D33, etc. And you can show that, obviously, this number has to differ from D1 because it differs in the first decimal place. It differs from D2 because it differs in the second. It differs from the nth one because it differs in the nth diagonal term. So therefore, you've constructed a decimal between 0 and 1, which is, in fact, not in your list. And then that contradicts your assumption or your, what you're trying to show, that you can enumerate a complete set of uh, decimals and put them in one-to-one -one correspondence. So this is the famous diagonal, diagonalization uh, proof of, of the cardinality of the real numbers. Now, this doesn't answer the continuum hypothesis that says, are there infinities in between these? And, yeah, between alpha 0 and alpha 1, or the cardinality of the rationals and the cardinality of the reals. reals right, because it says it's all bigger. Sets have the same cardinality. All countable sets have the same and cardinality, he right? Said that he didn't think that there was a set with a number of elements between those two, right? That's right. He postulated that the that the cardinalities were discrete. And nobody's ever been able to. No, that's called the continuum hypothesis. Uh, the continuum referring to the fact, the question: Are the infinities continuous? I mean, can you? find essentially a, a continuous mapping between the cardinalities? And the answer is, well, the answer is not yes or no. It's an assumption. It's an, it's an, it's an additional postulate. You can assume that there are or there are not, and both of them are consistent, completely consistent with natural number arithmetic. Okay. In fact, that was Hilbert's uh, second question was on the, you know, the, on the axiomization, and I believe he also had one of the six and one of his questions had to deal with the continuum hypothesis. And it was shown to be not, strictly speaking, dependent on the axioms. It was one of those postulates that you could never prove based just on uh, theorems or axioms on natural numbers and constructions such as rational numbers. Okay. So that's the famous diagonalization proof. And now here in words, and then I'll show you sort of what this means. Uh, so the idea is we want to prove that it's impossible to derive all correct, true mathematical statements from any set of axioms, finite or infinite. Okay, so here's how that goes. And we'll just go back and forth. It's easy to draw it sort of as a picture. So I'm going to have, say, this is the set of numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, infinite set of numbers. And then I'm going to have S is the set of all true mathematical statements regarding these numbers. So this is the set of SI where SI is a true statement. Well, no, it's not a true statement. It's a uh, it's a proposition. Let's see, it's just a it's just a statement. Should be a little more precise here. It's a statement. We're we're not going to assume that it's true or not. 
but which is either true or false. Which is either true or false for any integer. N equals zero in the integer and n, okay. And I should say that it's provably true. So in other words, there's an algorithm that tells you S13 is true or false given the argument n equals three, okay. So then what you do is the following is to say, okay, I've got all these numbers based on, you know, based on piano's axioms. So piano's axioms give you basically arithmetic. And this is the set of all mathematical statements that have anything to do with natural numbers. So obviously they're, you know, they're either true or they're false. I mean, these are not even theorems. These are a superset of all the statements. So then the, the, the kind of interesting thing here is that we now order the integers on one axis and the statements on the other. So we then just lay off a, a little grid. And this is the statement say, uh, I can call it zero here, or maybe just one, two, three, and we'll make this the origin. Four, five, six, etc. Let me just clean that up a little bit. Okay. So these are the natural numbers. And up here is the set S. So here is S zero. Here's the statement S one. S2, S3. Now, what I said before is that you could determine the truth or falsity of any lattice point here. So suppose I wanted to prove is S3 true or false at 4. Now, that's a point which is either true or false. So I could put a T or an F there, or a yes or a no. So I might put in a T. Or in this case, I think it uses a Y. So what, what we do is we construct a sequence. Every statement along the horizontal, every horizontal line corresponds to the range of values that this statement takes on for the natural numbers. And we said that all of these, they have a value. It's either true or false. It's not yes or no. It's, it, it's one or the other. It can't be both. So Every horizontal line is a sequence of y's, meaning it's true, or n, meaning it's false. So y means that si is true for x equals, you know, n equals for n. Okay. And n means it's false. Now, what we do is we just take this diagonal and we then construct, this diagonal has a series of y's and no's, this is a no's, and then you just reverse it. So then you reverse the sequence on the diagonal. And the key is to show that this is in fact the result of some statement which cannot be in your set S, right? Because this is the diagonalization result. If this statement taking on these values, it can't be statement zero because it disagrees with it for n equals zero. S cannot, and call that, that statement S hat, that statement S hat cannot be S zero because it differs for n equals zero. It can't be S one because it differs at S one can't be S2 because it differs at S2. So this statement S is not in your statement S by constructability, by the diagonalization. So that means you've come up with a statement that is not in your list. Now if you say, okay, that was just a, I forgot to add that one. Okay, 
So you put it in there somewhere, and then you just redo this. You come up with the same argument. No matter how many statements you add, there will always be statement, at least one statement, that cannot be proven. Okay, so that's what this says. To prove that it's impossible, let's bump this up here. So you can read it. Okay, so the idea is we want to prove that it's impossible to derive all mathematical truth from any set of self-evident axioms. Okay, that's a noble goal. And this is essentially proof by contradiction using Cantor's diagonal idea. So, if we assume that all mathematical truths can be derived from a chosen set of axioms, if that is true, then, and in principle, we can decide whether and test whether any statement or theorem derives from the chosen axioms. That is, whether it's true or false or not. Okay, so you can't have a theorem if you can't prove it, right? And it's either true or not, and if it's true or not, we, we have to be able to show that it's true or not. So at present, we don't have such an algorithm. But if it could exist, well, if it, if it showed that it doesn't exist, then that algorithm is one of these mathematical statements that cannot be proven. Okay. So, we don't have such an algorithm, and if we show that you can't even construct it, then we have succeeded in showing the, a non-provable statement. So, exactly what I just did. I list all the factual statements that can be made about a number that in, in the vertical axis, such as x is even. Now, x is even is a mathematical statement which can be applied to any x, 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4. Now, you always have the case where, you know, if x is even, is 0 even or odd? Well, they take it to be not even and not odd. It's kind of the exceptional one. But everything else is either even or odd. But even, uh, just forgetting 0, you can start at 1 if you want. It, it just means that you have a denumerable set. Okay, well, let's not get into the, the role of the zero right now. If you take another postulate, such as x is prime, clearly that's decidable for x equals 1, 2, 3, 4, up to infinity. Or if you can't do it for infinity, you have an algorithm for any finite number, and that's sufficient. Uh, you can decide as x less than 100. E that's easily true or false for any given natural number, any integer. So we create a table of these statements. So you start off with the simple statements on the bottom, and you move up in complexity as you get fat, better and better at theorem proving. And then you just apply them to all your natural numbers and say, are there any things that I've missed out? Because if I've missed something out, then that's an example of something that is not provable because the set contains supposedly all the provable axioms, everything that follows from the axioms by logic. Okay, so then they do this construction. 0, 1, 2, 3 on the bottom axis here. And then ask the question, is it odd? Well, 0 is n, 1 is no, 2 is yes, 3 is no, 4 is yes. Is odd? Okay, well, 0 is neither even or odd, so we'll take it to be no. 1 is not 0. What is that? 1, 2. I don't know, his y's and n's are confusing here. Anyway, you just make a sequence of numbers like we have here. Now the trick, and this is really where you have to think about it, is that you now pick the diagonal statement because it appears that you have all possible statements that can be made regarding natural numbers and then all the natural numbers, so this big grid has to contain all knowledge, right? Well, the diagonalization says no. You come up with a diagonal statement by looking at the diagonal, switching the yeses and the noes, and this is the, the kind of tricky part here that you have to think about. Which is right here. We know that we have legitimately created this yes and no pattern. That means that statement is true. So you have to sort of think about that. And I haven't thought through it enough to say that uh, that's as self-evident as they imply here. 
But assuming that that pattern is, in fact, a true statement, and it does not follow from any of the axiomatic statements that you've listed down, that means that you have to add that true statement as a new axiom. Well, you just end up keep on doing this forever and ever, and even if you do this a countable number of times, you're still left by the diagonal with statements that are not in the list. So therefore, such an algorithm is impossible, which is what we said was equivalent to the non-existence of algorithm A which is equivalent to proving number one. Now this, you said, gosh, this sounds like circular logic. Uh, it's not really, because what it ultimately says is that you would need an uncountable set of axioms to be closed. And unfortunately, it's very difficult to prove anything with an uncountable set of, of statements, right? Because if you have an uncountable list of statements, you can't even write a computer program or list an algorithm that can choose, right? You know, I mean, you would not even know how to select axioms or postulates or hypotheses from an uncountable list, something that was the same cardinality as the real numbers. Do you even do it with an uncountable Well, this is where the axiom of choice says that there exists a selection, selector function that you can choose, but then how would you actually do the logic? How would you... I mean, there would, there would be no decidability because, practically speaking, even if you, no computer could ever do anything in that setting because right. they can only, there's a discrete time interval between executing statements and you can never even list the axioms, much less decide right. whether axioms followed from them because there would always be, I mean, so we, we can't deal with a system of logic and they're improving when you have an uncountable n number of axioms or statements. Okay, um, so that's the basis of Gödel's theorem. Now, what we're going to do next, and this is let's close this, go back to the uh, lecture notes here. Go forward to the, okay, we've gone a little bit past here. So we started off with set theory, and we talked about the axiomatic method. Let's bump this up a little bit. One more. Okay, so we've gone through axiomatic set theory, essentially the axiomatic method, piano's axioms to construct the natural numbers, Cantor's diagonalization, the undecidable continuum hypothesis, and finally to show that this is a generic feature of mathematical theorem proving, namely that you can always come up with things that you can neither prove are true or false because they're independent of your axioms. That is, every time you think you have a closed system, you can make a fork by adding one of these undecidable postulates as an axiom, and it splits off into two different arithmetics. For example, we know this is true in geometry because the parallel postulate, if you assume the existence of one line, you have Euclidean geometry. If you have infinite number of lines, you have basically spherical geometry. And if you have no lines, it would be basically hyperbolic geometry. So you now split geometry into three different directions based on the parallel postulate. Okay, so what we're going to do next is go through limits. Now, limits is important because this is a process of analysis which deals essentially with the infinite. As we saw early on in the first or second lecture, the Greeks had paradoxes that came fundamentally because of their imprecise definitions of infinity. They could not decide whether time and space were discretizable or not or continuous. And they had problems dealing with infinite sequences, infinite series, infinite lists of numbers, et cetera. So limits gives us a much more mathematically precise way of handling infinity. So we, we're going to go talk a little bit about this here. So I'm going to add one problem uh, later on today. So uh, I should point out here, please look at the new link submissions here. And what you'll see is a list to see whether I've got your homework or not. 
So this is only for electronic submissions. If you put it in by hand, I'll mark you received in a different color there, but it will be received. So by 12 o'clock midnight, I will know who has received, who has given me electronic things or not. And this also, these are valid email addresses, so you can, of course, use it to uh, get in contact with each other. Uh, but not for the purposes of cloning or copying homework problems. That's a no-no. Okay, um, videos, we'll add that. Homework problems. The, the second homework problem has to do with the constructability of the rational numbers. I'm going to add another problem, 2A, which will have to do um, with the Pythagorean theorem proof here that we saw earlier on, the Java one or Don's geometric one. And then basically just turn this geometrical visualization into a quasi-rigorous set of statements following what we did in class. Now, again, don't do it by means of similar triangles, but just make this process a little more rigorous so that you can get used to the idea of turning a sort of pencil and paper back of the envelope concept of, gee, I think this is true because of this following set of constructions into something that is more rigorous. Okay? I mean, that's a, that's a very archetypal mathematical problem, right? You will often make a conjecture on the basis of some back of the envelope scratch calculations. And the question is, can you turn that conjecture into a true statement, into a theorem? What do you have to change? Do you have to change? Do you have to tighten up your hypotheses? Do you have to eliminate something because of some special case that you can't handle, etc.? The one thing, of course, that you're not permitted to do in mathematics is to put your conclusion as part of your assumptions. Because if your assumptions are, if and only if the conclusion, that means you're essentially assuming the result. And you can, of course, if you assume the result, you can prove the result because A implies A is always true, okay? So we don't allow that. So you're allowed to show that your hypotheses imply your conclusion, but you cannot turn it around and say that your conclusion implies your hypotheses, because that says that your conclusion is essentially equivalent, and it's a circular argument. Sort of like, you know, if A implies B, B implies C, and C implies A, and you want to prove, and you, and you assume A and C, and you want to prove B, then, you know, it's obviously, they're all equivalent, so it's easy to do. Okay, so that's, that's the idea here. Now, I have put in some more readings. Uh, there is some news here. Uh, there are two visualizations to the proof of Pythagorean theorem. Also, I've got some additional references in the readings. If you go down to the bottom, those are all web links above. But I've given you two library references, uh, Morris Klein's very famous book, Mathematical Thought from Ancient to Modern Times, and another little thing here, which I'll, I'll be doing some links to later on, of course, The Mathematical Tourist. Because we will actually come eventually to some more modern problems, such as notions of dimensionality and fractals and chaos and things like that. So. Uh, the website is continually being added and upgraded to, so I poke along in through here periodically. I'll try, every time this changes down in the table of contents, I will try to alert you in the news. So let, go to the news first, then look through these links and print out or